BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays this year I've been doing a regular segment about the Phantom Killer, an unidentified serial killer who operated in Texarkana in 1946. And to begin the series, I did one episode where I responded to the biography on one of the investigators, Lone Wolf Gonzalez, and the um, full title is Lone Wolf Gonzalez, Texas Ranger, written by Browns and Moss. And for the uh, subsequent episodes, I've been talking about the book, The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of Texarkana's Serial Murders, The Story of a Town in Terror by James Presley. And I definitely recommend this book, but what I'm looking forward to in the near future is cross-referencing it with other sources, because even from my own minimal understanding of the case before reading this book is that not everyone is going to agree with James Presley's observations. And I think that it's very important to look at what other people think about any subject, and that's what I do mostly here on Black Box Online Radio. And in addition to the Phantom Killer saga, you can follow along with other true crime cases here, such as the Zodiac Killer. Every Monday is Zodiac Monday here on Black Box Online Radio. And on Friday, I will be revisiting the case of Jack the Ripper. And on the weekends, I launched a regular segment about the death of Jean Benet Ramsey in 1996. So hit the like button, subscribe, and a great way to support all of these efforts is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box. Buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Mondays. But I think a lot of you are very curious about this particular episode because this is one where I will focus on the suspect, and not only the suspect, but the prime suspect in the case, Yule Swinney. And I said in the early part of the Phantom Killer saga that I didn't just want to read large sections from someone else's book and then give some commentary. I wanted to do most of it on my own, but I just don't think I can do it any other way. So I'm going to have a little bit of a read from page 186 in The Phantom Killer by James Presley. Yule Lee Swinney, at 29, was no stranger to jails. His criminal record stretched as far back as 1929, at least when he was 12. By 1946, 17 years later, he was an ex-convict several times over. At the time of his arrest in July, he'd been out of the Texas penitentiary in barely more than six months having made it to Texarkana in time for Christmas, 1945. He'd served time in a reform school, two state penitentiaries, and federal prisons in Oklahoma, Georgia, and Kansas. His resume was impressive in a negative sense, highlighting a variety of crimes ranging from theft, burglary, and counterfeiting to strong-arm robbery. This was the first time that he had been a suspect in a murder case. And I think that the age, though of the perpetrator in the Phantom Killer mystery is somewhat suitable. Yul Swinney would have been 29 years old, and the Phantom Killer operated from February 22nd to to May 3rd of 1946. 
and the first Trump attack occurred on February 22nd when Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae were beaten by somebody wearing either a pillowcase or a sack over their head. It's a type of white mask, so to speak. But um, the second attack occurred on March 24th of 1946, more than a month later, and that, those were the actual first murders committed by this person. And they were the murders of Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. An interesting note is that this book states that the attacks on Griffin and Moore occurred on March 23rd, but almost all of the other sources state that it occurred on March 24th. And you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal about that? I mean, like, even if, even if, hypothetically, somebody got it off by one day, I mean, okay, I mean, let's look at the analytical statements rather than nitpicking something to do with a date. Well, I will share a reason why that's very important later on about this March 23rd, March 24th, so please stay tuned. Born in 1917 in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, Swinney appeared in the census in 1920 as a member of the family residing in Redland Township of New Edinburgh, Cleveland County, in southern Arkansas. The father of the household, Stanley Swinney, was a 32-year-old Arkansas native and a Baptist minister at New Edinburgh, apparently a preaching job. The mother, Myrtle Looney Swinney, was also 32. She had been born in Georgia. Yule was two years old, the, the fifth of five children, with two older brothers and two older sisters. So he is the youngest, what some people would call the baby of the family. Over the years, the elder Swinney moved and frequently moved about frequently at various times in Bodcow and Miller County, Arkansas, in Stamps and Eureka Springs in Arkansas, and Texarkana on both sides, the Texas side and the Arkansas side. Yule exhibited signs of trouble early in life. Essentially, he fell through the cracks of society in a rocky family environment. I know he was in trouble all the time, a niece of the um, older brother, Cleo, that is. That would be the uh, daughter. Her, her name is actually Joyce said this about him, and that um, the family memories that she heard were that um, Yule Swinney was struggling with numerous things, but even Mr. Swinney Sr. was struggling with things such as alcoholism. Neither parent gave Yule much attention. It was as if he was unwanted. His mother and his father didn't care, Joyce said. I hate to say it, but it's true, Mr. Sweeney repeatedly stated with, um, well, um, I, I gotta read that sentence again. I hate to say it, but it's true. Mr. Sweeney Sr. was repeatedly stated to be a ladies' man. Cleo, the, old, the eldest son, eventually assumed a role of being the responsible adult, helping rear his younger siblings while holding a job. He also grew a vegetable garden, raised hogs for meat, and kept a cow and beehives, all to feed the large family. His parents' behavior were a sore spot of some. And, yes, um, it seems like you'll... Yul Swinney's father was the um, preacher, however, he was also doing things behind the scenes. And this whole thing about how the older brother has to take on all the parental responsibilities, that does affect people psychologically, and that doesn't seem uncommon behavior for someone to turn into a serial killer. It's also quite normal for other serial killers to have these types of um, behaviors, in their life, such as um, theft, burglary, counterfeiting, strong arm robbery, it's normal for deviant behavior to escalate in a serial killer. And Dr. Todd Grande has talked about this a lot on his YouTube channel, and I would invite people to watch some of his videos if they are curious more about that development. But I told you that the dates would be very important in this. What would be some actual evidence? that could connect Yul Swinney to being the person who committed a serial killer crime spree in 1946. All right, so Yul Swinney has been recently married to a woman named Peggy. Peggy Swinney, as she is referred to, and her uh, testimony is actually mentioned in an earlier part of this book. Peggy Swinney would be interrogated by multiple police officers. I believe the exact number is... She's interrogated four times, and 12 different officers participated in the interrogations over those four times. 
But one thing that she shared was, on February 22nd of 1946, again, Yule is 29 years old, she could not account for his whereabouts. That's one thing. And then, this is important, though, about this whole March 23rd, March 24th. It says in the book on March 23rd of 1946 that they went to stay at um, her mother's house. That would be Yule's mother-in-law. So they're staying at a relative's house. But then Yule Swinney disappears for two and a half hours in the night. Allegedly, supposedly, on the night of the murders of Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. So, again, just disappearing and then this double homicide takes place. Is that also not something that is rather odd? Then on the next crime... About two weeks later, this is um, this would be April 14th, the murders of Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin. This seemed like one that, um, during the first interrogation, Peggy Swinney rather got it into somewhat of a blurry mess, but her memory would straighten up later on, because then you'd find out that she may have actually been a witness to this one. But uh, during the first um, round of testimony, it just seems like a blur. But then she states that, Shortly after the murder of Virgil Starks on May 3rd of 1946, her and Yule got into a big argument, and that just stood out in her mind. Again, citing The Phantom Killer by James Presley for this material. There is an immediate piece of counter-argument that is mentioned right in this book, and that is that the police interrogated Yule Swinney as well, and he even acknowledged that he was gone for roughly two and a half hours on the day of the um, Griffin Moore murders. But it was earlier in the day, it was not at nighttime when the murders would have been taken place. And then that's just going to turn into, well, who are you going to believe? And I said this whole March 23rd, March 24th thing is important because alibis, whereabouts, pinpointing someone's exact movements on a particular day. And you might already be noticing that there seems to be a lot of marital strife going on between Peggy Swinney and Yule Swinney, and maybe it's fair to say that she wanted out of the marriage or wanted nothing to do with him. But Peggy Swinney's even going to go on to say in the future that she was actually either witnessing a murder or very close by, and that her heel print got embedded in the soil around one of the crime scenes, and they did seem to find a heel print that seemed consistent with that. And the most important detail is one that I've shared on the channel many times, is that Betty Jo Booker, the victim in the third attack, was a musician, and that her saxophone that she played, and she was actually playing at a concert right before the murder, or shortly before the murder, the saxophone case was taken, and thrown over a fence on the right side of the road. And Peggy Swinney was able to share that information with um, the investigators, even though, as I said, she had been interrogated four times by 12 different officers and talked to her attorney, and I cite Jeremy Kennington for that. So did she learn about it a different way and just decide that she wanted to vilify her husband because she wanted nothing to do with him? I mean, it definitely seems like she wanted nothing to do with him if she's trying to get him convicted for being a serial killer, knowing fully well that he could easily get the death penalty. Another piece of evidence in favor of Yule Swinney being the phantom killer is that he was arrested for stealing a car, and he said he's going to get the chair, and there was like, and of course people don't really get the electric chair for stealing cars, and then he says, Oh, you've got me for a lot more than stealing cars. And some people think that that was an admission of guilt. If I could be very honest with you, when I first learned about Yule Swinney as a phantom killer suspect, I did not like it. I did not like the narrative. I just thought people are reading too much into those types of details, such as, oh, you got me for a lot more than stealing cars. Well, that's not an admission to being the phantom killer. At the same time, he is been the prime suspect for all of these years. However, there's also a very um, interesting detail that was shared in The Phantom Killer by James Presley, and that is that 
two years before, when Yule would have been 27, his height was listed as 5 foot 11, and he weighed 166 pounds. So a very, very tall, skinny guy. I know that's two years before. Okay, not very tall, very skinny guy. He would have looked, um, perhaps very thin around people. 5 foot 11, 166 pounds. The way that the Phantom Killer seems to be handling some of the victims, particularly uh, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore, who were attacked and then their bodies were staged, and this um, killer would have had to have carried at least uh, Polly Ann Moore's body from outside and placed her inside a car. And the, um, the reason why I say that is both of them were shot. However, uh, there was a large pooling of blood on the ground, suggesting that Polly Ann Moore had been shot outside of the car, and that her body had been picked up, lifted, and put inside the car. I think we're dealing with a larger perpetrator than that, and I would expect that if you'll Swinney <laughs> have had to have bulked up a lot over those two years. And when you read about the uh, ways that the victims were attacked, not only Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore, but also Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin, then it seems like the killer is just really overpowering them, let alone the attack on Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae, where somebody was able to just completely have his way with both the victims, beating them, and um, like Mary Jean LeRae was sexually assaulted, and it doesn't seem like someone who was just this frail, skinny guy. I get two years before the attacks. The final piece of criticism that I will share with you is, if... There is some truth that Yul Swinney's alibi about being gone for two and a half hours on the night of the Griffin Moore murders actually happened early in, or in the day, and the police accepted that. Well, does that not exonerate him? Wouldn't that mean that he was at his mother-in-law's house at the time of the murder? I mean, his wife didn't seem to think so. But also, it seems like she's just trying to get rid of him, maybe she had regrets about marrying him or something. Now, as I said, who's telling the truth? I mean, was this guy the phantom killer? Or was he just at home, sleeping in his bed or something? I'll leave that up to you guys. And I'm still not completely abandoning the theory that there's a lot of mass hysteria involved with this. So you have the attack on, on Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae, where they actually see the killer, or the perpetrator, in the white-hooded costume. At this time, to the best of our knowledge, the phantom killer hasn't murdered anyone. And then, somebody actually commits a double murder on uh, March 24th of 1946, shooting um, both of the victims, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore, in the head, and then there's the double murder on April 14th of Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin. And then the murder of Virgil Starks on May 3rd of 1946. But there's only one actual sighting of the person in the hooded costume. And that's when he's beating Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean LeRae. There does appear to be the same firearm used in the attacks on Griffin and Moore and Booker and Martin. All right, that could easily be the same killer. Two double homicides. But the murder of Virgil Starks did use the same type of firearm. Those crimes that I just stated, those four people were shot with a thirty-two, And then Virgil Starks, the final victim, was shot with a twenty-two. So, different firearm, different location. Virgil Starks was attacked in a house. And all the other victims were attacked by cars. Or inside their car, there is a man and a woman who are present in or around a vehicle very, very similar to the Zodiac murders. I cannot get over this. The Zodiac crimes of the 1960s, it's almost like the Texarkana murders were an odd type of blueprint or template for the Zodiac crimes, which would come later. Or it could just simply be coincidental, or not even coincidental, but psychological, that this is the way that a spree killer operates. But mass hysteria would be, there's this attack where this hooded perpetrator is beating two people. Then there are two sets of murders that took place. So people are drawing the connection that it has to be the same person. 
because this is the, the phantom killer who's on the loose, and they're tying this all together. And then everyone's watching the lover's lane, so then they just expect that the phantom killer did something different, and he attacked Virgil Starks and his wife Katie Starks. But no credible sighting of the perpetrator in the white hooded costume at the Starks farm. And not to mention different firearm. That could have easily have been a different person. And then the media stitched it together, making it seem like these five murders were all committed by the same person, when in reality, you have at least three different perpetrators, and they were unconnected crimes. I'm curious about that. Is that what actually happened? Or it could have just been Yule Swinney. What do you think? Please put your ideas in the comment section down below. I know I didn't get to everything in this episode, but I will get back to the story of Yule Swinney in the near future. And share some ideas. Put your comments down below. I would love to read them. That's all from me now, and I will see you over on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.